Uh, at the Theatre's Trust, I'm working a lot at the moment with community campaign groups or fledgling companies and charities, helping to strengthen their governance arrangements so they can take on or better deliver theatre redevelopment projects. And um, I also spent a decade working with the National Tree Heritage Fund within the London and South grants teams, supporting small scale to multi-million uh, pound projects from conception to valuation across the range of the cultural heritage sector. And there I worked with a range of organisations from small voluntary community groups or new trusts, looking at capacity building and resilience and larger organisations like national museums on big building redevelopment and restoration projects. I also spent a number of years working with firms in project development, uh, first as a consultant at Barker Langham and more recently as a director at Tricola, where I helped organisations pull together strategic reports for major funding bids. So uh, this afternoon, I'm going to spend about 40 minutes running you through what is governance, the different types of legal structures to consider in the UK, uh, looking at the differences between incorporated and unincorporated and charitable and non-charitable structures. Then what do we mean by good governance and the principles in the charity governance code, the role of the board and what makes it effective, how governance might need to adapt and change throughout the life cycle of a heritage project, and then finally, um, leave you with some top tips on good governance and links to further sources you might want to explore. And then we'll have a few minutes, hopefully at the end, for some questions. Um, I should add a disclaimer that I'm not a legal expert. Um, so if you're unsure about your organisation's planned or proposed governance arrangements, then do, speak, do seek advice from, from an expert. So to start with, um, let's take a look at what governance actually is. Now, here's a technical definition from the Association of Project Management. It describes governance as the framework of authority and accountability that defines and controls the outputs, outcomes and benefits from projects, pro uh, programmes and portfolios. It's the mechanism whereby the investing organisation exerts financial and technical control over the deployment of the work and the realisation of value. Uh, that's a bit of a jargon heavy way of saying it's the process by which authority is granted, by which the rules are set and by which those rules are enforced and modified. It's really the strategic directing of the project or organisation and looks at the big picture. And it's important to say that for heritage and arts organisations, accountability really is more complex and nuanced. The board has got to align its work with the best interests of its community and stakeholders, often reflecting the organisation's broader heritage, social and societal responsibilities. So governance can't just be restricted to legal and financial responsibilities. So uh, I'm just going to run you through some of the legal structures. Um, and in setting up a business structure in the UK, there are a range of legal models to choose from. Um, as a starting point, there really are two key factors to consider. Uh, incorporation versus unincorporation and charitable versus non-charitable. So an unincorporated association is a voluntary organisation set up through an agreement between a group of people who come together for a reason other than to make profit. So for example, that could be a voluntary group or a sports club. And as a membership organisation, it can be whatever it meant its members want it to be and carry out whatever activities the members choose. Many community groups are run entirely by volunteers to benefit their own members, improve their local neighbourhood or run campaigns. You don't need to register as an unincorporated association and it doesn't cost anything to set one up. However, individual members are personally responsible for any debts and contractual obligations, so there is what's known as unlimited liability and you're only subject to protection through any insurance you may hold. <clears throat> It is, however, perfectly acceptable uh, for a small venture with no or limited liabilities. And all you have to do to set one up is write and agree a constitution. An unincorporated association can be a charity, but it doesn't have to be. And many unincorporated associations primarily benefit their own members, so they're not considered to be charitable and aren't regulated by charity law. For an unincorporated organisation to be a charity, it must have charitable aims and be run for the public benefit. Uh, if your group isn't charitable, you don't need to register with or report to anyone. Very frequently, you might see an unincorporated structure, either a charitable trust or an unincorporated association in the very, very initial stages of a heritage project. For example, a group of local people getting together to set up a campaign to protect a local heritage asset. 
it's a quick and easy way to create an agreement between the group that might include ways to tackle engaging stakeholders and gaining local support with the aim of disbanding once a project gets off the ground or evolving into another legal structure to take the project forward. It's a good quick way of signifying that there's consensus in local support. On the other hand, you've got the incorporated organisation and that's got its own legal personality. Incorporation is a process through which an organisation goes from being a single uh, a collection of individuals in the eyes of the law to a single entity which is legally separate from the individuals involved. Debts and liabilities are those of the legal entity, not individual board members, and liability is limited to the amount of paid share capital or guarantee. It can enter into contracts, buy or lease property and employ people in its own right. It can also borrow money and receive grants. The downside is organisations with incorporated legal structures are more closely regulated than those without. They take longer to set up, require more ongoing work to keep running, and are more likely to incur costs for services from accountants and solicitors, but they do generally offer protection and insurance. Most typically, we see heritage projects delivered by incorporated structures, like a company limited by a guarantee with charitable status, a charitable incorporated organisation, or a charitable community benefit society, primarily as having that charitable status can unlock many more funding opportunities in the sector. So will your organisation be charitable? Uh, a not-for-profit organisation is a broad term for all independent organisations whose purpose is something other than to make private profit for directors, members or shareholders. Many different types of organisation can be not-for-profit, but it's not a legal structure in and of itself. A charity in England and Wales is defined by law as an organisation which has exclusively charitable purposes and is regulated by the High Court's charity law jurisdiction. As part of this, charities must prove they exist for the public benefit. And there are a restricted number of charitable purposes as set out in the 2011 Charities Act. And all the, de the definitions are explained on the Charity Commission website. Arts and heritage charities also have a merit test and a public benefit test that they need to pass in order to qualify. If an organisation meets that criteria, it is by definition a charity, even if it isn't registered with the Charity Commission, which is why you get the unincorporated charitable trust. If an organisation doesn't meet that criteria, then it's not a charity. It can't register with a Charity Commission and it's not subject to charity regulation. The exception is a charitable community benefit society, which isn't regulated by the Charity Commission, but by the Financial Conduct Authority instead. Uh, and one of the key benefits of being a charity is it can often get grants from other charities and bodies and is tax, tax attractive with things like gift aid and legacies. So I'm now going to run you through some of the key legal structures available in the UK. And here I've just split them up into um, charitable and non-charitable status for you to see. Um, and the range of legal entities available and most relevant to the heritage sector has expanded in recent years to include community interest companies and charitable incorporated organisations, which potentially offer greater flexibility and choice um, in levels of regulation and accountability. There's also been a bit of a resurgence in the cooperative societies and community benefit societies, which were previously known as industrial and provident societies, but those have been around since around the mid-1800s. The UK also has uh, other structures like local authorities and education establishments, but I'm not going to go into those today. Um, so the first of the charitable structures um, I'm just going to talk about is a charitable trust. Um, this is a type of charity run by a small group of people known as its trustees. The trustees appointed rather than elected and there is no wider membership. A charitable trust isn't incorporated, so it can't enter into contracts or own property in its own right. And to set up a trust, your group must write and sign a trust deed, which must show that the organisation is legally charitable. There's a model trust deed on the Charity Commission website, and charities must register with them if they have an income over 5,000 a year. A trust is simple to administer and slightly quicker and cheaper to establish than a charitable company limited by guarantee or a CIO. But in the case of the trust, as there's no separate corporate identity, the debts and potential liabilities of the charity can become the liability of trustees personally if it can't be met out of the trust resources. 
Uh, next up is a company limited by guarantee. Um, this is incorporated and is a type of company which doesn't distribute income to shareholders and will be controlled by a group of directors. Companies are registered with and regulated by Companies House. And to establish a company, you have to adopt a governing document called a memorandum and article of associations and submit it to Companies House. If all surplus income is reinvested back into the organisation uh, and not distributed to shareholders, it can also be not for profit. And it can be a charity if it meets the legal requirements required by charity law. There must be uh, clear from it, and this must be clear from the governing document. So if you wish to set up a charitable company, you should also use the model memorandum and articles of association approved by the Charity Commission and register with the Charity Commission, as well as Companies House, and then submit your annual report and accounts to both organisations annually. In order to be considered charitable, the directors of a company are usually unpaid. Um, charities may pay their directors in exceptional circumstances, but organisations that are wishing to pay their directors as a matter of course are likely to find that the community interest company or the community benefit society or cooperative model are, are more suitable. Uh, across the cultural heritage sector, the majority of organisations are still working within the dual model of a company limited by guarantee with a registered charity status. And, and this was the traditional model uh, used by building preservation trusts. If you're setting up a new organisation, it is worth considering whether the charitable incorporated organisation would suit your needs better. So the CIO was introduced in 2013. It's a corporate form specifically designed for and available only to charities. CIOs do not need to register with Companies House and aren't subject to company law. They're solely registered with the Charity Commission and only regulated by charity law. This really reduces the upfront paperwork and ongoing filing obligations, which can lead to cost savings and is, av is advantageous to trustees with no previous knowledge of running a company. CIOs are quicker to register at the Charity Commission than other types of charities, and registration is also easier as they're not required to show any proof of funds. Uh, the £5,000 income threshold for other charities doesn't apply to CIOs. Uh, it's worth saying there are two types of CIO models, the association and foundation model. The association being um, uh, those CIOs are membership organisations and hold elections, whereas the foundation model are run by a small group of appointed trustees. Like a charitable company, a CIO is a separate legal entity with a separate legal personality, so it can employ staff, own property and enter into contracts. Liabilities fall on the organisation rather than an individual trustees. And other types of organisations can convert to being a CIO. A community Benefits Society, this is incorporated and can have paid directors. It's owned by its members who hold shares and control the society democratically on a one member, one vote basis. The society must exist primarily for the benefit of the wider community and members may not receive preferential treatment. Profits must be used for the benefit of the community, although interest on shares can be paid to members up to a maximum rate. The Community Benefits Society can apply for a statutory asset lock, which will allow it to guarantee its not-for-profit status. Um, it can register as a charitable Community Benefits Society with the Financial Conduct Authority if it has aims that are exclusively charitable and that statutory asset lock specifying that any assets would be transferred to another charity if the organisation wound up. This allows the organisation to call itself a charity, although it's not regulated by the Charity Commission. This structure is useful if your community wishes to take control of an asset such as a building and it can help you fund your organisation by selling community shares um, and run the service to benefit the wider community. It's becoming increasingly popular in recent years with organisations like the Plunkett Foundation sponsoring model rules to support, to support community businesses um, like within community pubs. Moving on to the three non-charitable structures I want to highlight. Um, so a company limited by shares is incorporated, and so it is, a legal, uh, is legally separate from the people that run it, and it's usually a business that makes profit. It's got shares and shareholders who've got certain rights. For example, directors may need shareholders to vote and agree changes to the organisation. Most companies have ordinary shares, which means directors get one vote on company decisions per share and receive dividend payments. 
the organisation can keep any profit it makes after paying tax, so it isn't charitable. And often the structure is used by heritage organisations when forming a trading subsidiary, which I'll briefly mention in a minute. Next is the community interest company. So a non-charitable company can still be not for profit. Um, many social enterprises are non-charitable companies. If your organisation is not charitable, you can guarantee your not for profit status by becoming a community interest company. The CICs commit their assets uh, and profits permanently to community by means of an asset lock, ensuring that assets are used for the benefit of the community. They've got paid directors, um, and as it's not a charity, it can't usually get tax benefits like gift aid. To register a new CIC, you have to apply to Companies House and describe how your company will benefit the community. A cooperative society is incorporated and can have paid directors. It's very similar in structure, in structure to a community benefit society, but its main purpose is to provide services to its members rather than the wider community. Cooperative societies have to be based on the cooperative values of self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equality, equity and, and solidarity. In general, membership to a cooperative society is open to people who use the services provided by the society or work for, work for the society, uh, and profits may be distributed to members, providing this isn't the primary purpose of the organisation. A cooperative can't be charitable because its beneficiaries are its own members rather than the public, and they're also regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, a different legal structure that you might see is the group structure. Um, so these are formal association of separate organisations linked by ownership. They typically include a parent charity setting up other charities and non-charitable subsidiaries, including tra uh, trading subsidiaries, usually set up to generate income for the charity. It's often established as a private company limited by shares, with the, sh with the sole shareholder being the parent company. It's important to note that charities can trade if it's their primary purpose, an ancillary purpose, or if they come under the small trading exemption. But these are also useful um, if a charity makes profit close to or higher than the small trading exemption limit, or if it wants to protect itself from risk. A trading subsidiary will be liable to pay tax on its profits. However, it can pass trading profits back up to its parent charity as gift aid and claim charitable donations relief reducing the subsidiary's corporation tax liability potentially to zero if all profits are donated. And just lastly, in terms of structures, um, it's quickly also worth mentioning that in terms of developing and delivering a heritage project, you might also see some of these informal structures in place. A joint venture is a commercial arrangement between two or more parties who agree to pool their resources for the purpose of accomplishing a defined task. A collaborative arrangement involves separate organisations working together to achieve a specific shared objective, but where each organisation maintains its own identity and independence, although it may have a joint name. The partners in a coalition might appoint a lead or accountable body who is solely accountable to a funder, for example, for receiving funding and delivering the work, but they can often um, explore options for sharing risks among partners. And very often you might see this with a larger organisation like a council or a building owner working with a smaller community group, but there'll be a clear joint working agreement in place. So having talked about what governance is and what legal structures are available, um, now I want to focus a bit more on, on practising good governance, specifically within a charitable organisation within the heritage sector. And governance really is about attitudes and culture and whether a charity puts its values into practice. It's about how trustees make decisions and how well they understand what's going on. It's about realising potential, understanding and maximising the difference you make. And everything in good governance should point to your mission and your strategy for achieving it. I've already mentioned that for heritage and arts organisations, that accountability is complex and nuanced. The board has to align its work with the best interests of its community and stakeholders and reflect the organisation's broader heritage, social and societal responsibilities. So it can't just think about its legal and financial responsibilities. The Charity Commission and Companies House uh, will set out the basic requirements that organisations need to meet, but in order to be operating most effectively, 
organisations should be striving to reach high standards and best practice. So this is where the charity governance code can come in. Now, this is a practical tool to help charities and their trustees develop high standards of governance and ensure they are fit for purpose. It's not a legal or regulatory requirement. It draws upon, but is fundamentally different to the Charity Commission's guidance. Instead, the code sets the principles and recommended practice for good governance and is deliberately aspirational. Some elements of the code will be a stretch for many charities to achieve, but it's meant to be used as a tool for continuous improvement towards the highest standards. Charity boards that are using this code effectively will regularly revisit and reflect on the code's principles. The code is intended to, use, to be used by charities registered in England and Wales, but much of it will apply um, also to other not-for-profit not organisations that deliver a public or community benefit and those with a social purpose. The code's principles, rationale and outcomes are universal and apply equally to all charities, whatever their size or activities. There's a larger and smaller version of the code, so those with a typical income over a million a year and whose accounts are externally audited are invited to use the larger version and charities below the threshold can use the smaller version. The code doesn't attempt to set out all the legal requirements that apply to charities and charity trustees, but it is based on a foundation of trustees' basic legal and regulatory responsibilities. The principles build on the assumption that charities are already meeting this foundation and its starting point is that all trustees are committed to the charity's cause and have joined its board because they want to help the charity deliver its purposes most effectively for pu public benefit, uh, that they recognise that meeting the charity's state of public benefit is an ongoing requirement, that they understand their roles and legal responsibilities, and in particular that they've read and understand the Charity Commission's guidance, the essential trustee. Also that their charity governing document uh, or rather that they understand their charity's governing document and that they're committed to good governance and want to contribute to their charity's continued improvement. The code itself was revised in 2020 to refine two of the seven principles, the equality, diversity, inclusion principle and the integrity principle. So uh, just to quickly run through um, the, the seven principles. So there are seven principles which make up the code. Uh, and as, as it said, it, um, it builds on that assumption that a charity is meeting its legal and regulatory responsibilities as a foundation. And the first principle is organisational purpose. So here it describes uh, that the board should be clear about its charity aims and ensures that these are being delivered effectively and sustainably. They should be periodically reviewing their charitable purposes and uh, agreeing a strategy to achieve their purposes. All trustees should be able to explain their public benefit. The second principle is leadership. Um, so here it describes how every charity should be led by an effective board that provides strategic leadership in line with the charity's aims and values. This includes having proper arrangements in place for any staff and volunteers, making sure that the board functions are properly recorded, that there's a chair in place with overall responsibility for leadership, that there's a productive culture, and that trustees add value and govern well. The board should lead by example and provide sufficient commitment in terms of time, but also be clear about the crossover between board activities and operational ones. The third principle is integrity. Now here it describes how the board should be uh, acting with integrity, adopting values and creating a culture which helps achieve the organisation's charitable purposes. The board should be aware of the importance of the public's confidence uh, and trust in charities and trustees undertake their duties accordingly. They should always uphold the charity's values, understand and meet their safeguarding responsibilities and make sure they identify, deal and record conflicts of interest or loyalty. The fourth principle is decision making, risk and control. Here it describes how the board should make sure that its decision-making processes are informed, rigorous and timely, and that effective delegation, control and risk assessment, and that management systems are set up and monitored. The board should have a clear process for delegation and that committees have suitable terms of reference. Policies should be regularly reviewed and updated, risks should be actively managed, and organisational performance regularly monitored and managed. The fifth principle is board effectiveness. 
Uh, here it talks about how the board should work as an effective team using the appropriate balance of skills, experience, backgrounds and knowledge to help it make informed decisions. They should meet as often as it is needed to be effective, regularly discuss its effectiveness and ability to work together, its motivations and behaviours. It should regularly review its composition, balancing the need for continuity with the need to refresh the board with trustee vacancies advertised widely. The sixth principle uh, is equality, diversity and inclusion. And here it talks about how the board's approach to, diver to diversity should support its effectiveness, leadership and decision making. It recommends that the board should assess understanding of systems and culture and identify gaps in understanding which could be filled by discussion, learning, research or information. Context specific and realistic plans and targets should be set for EDI and appropriate action should be taken and performance against targets and plans monitored and published. And the final principle is openness accountability. So uh, the code talks about how the board should lead the organisation in being transparent and accountable, that the charity is open in its work unless there is a good reason for it not to be. And this should include communicating and consulting effectively with stakeholders, developing a culture of openness within the charity. And in charities where trustees are appointed by an organisational membership wider than trustees, the board should be clear and open in its engagement with members. So in a charity structure, your board of trustees will be responsible for providing good governance and leadership for your organisation. They are collectively responsible and accountable for ensuring that the organisation is performing well, is solvent and complies with all of its obligations. The most effective boards are likely to be chaired by someone who's well connected and a go-getter and who has got time to give to the organisation. A strong board of trustees will have a variety of professional and relevant skills to contribute and you'll also want them to be ambassadors for the organisation and willing to actively engage with fundraising strategies. The Charity Commission provides essential reading and guidance for trustees which explains what trustees do and their legal responsibilities and that document the essential trustee. Trustees must make sure that everyone complies with the governing document and the document might need to be reviewed and changed and changed from time to time, but it should set out what the charity exists to do, which is known as its objects, how it can operate, which is its powers, who can be a trustee uh, or a member, if applicable, and the structure of the board explaining how board members are appointed, how many board members are required for there to be a quorum, the size of the board and how long a term lasts and rules about meetings and decisions and how to change and close down. And three of the most common trustee roles uh, that you're, you're likely to see are the chair, treasurer, uh, sorry, yeah, the chair, secretary and treasurer. Uh, the chair's primary role is to ensure that the board is effective in its task of setting and implementing the organisation's direction and strategy. They act as that figurehead and spokesperson by representing the organisation to the outside world. They manage and support uh, the board of trustees, but creating a team rather than a group of individuals by promoting a strong sense of mutual commitment, whilst ensuring that individual members contribute regularly and effectively. If there is a staff, they will line manage and frequently interact with management, particularly the CEO, CEO or director, acting as a conduit between the trustees and senior staff. Most charities will have a person, whether it's a trustee, volunteer or member of paid staff, who will provide the administrative support necessary for it to function. Sometimes the requirements for such a person, known as the secretary, exist in the charity's governing document, but even when this isn't the case, the need remains. And the key role of the secretary is to ensure meetings are effectively organised and decisions recorded. They uphold the legal requirements of governing documents in compliance with charity and or company law and the relevant regulators. Although these functions may fall within the scope of the secretary, responsibility for seeing that they're discharged falls on the board of trustees as a whole. And it's important that the secretary is appropriately experienced or trained to carry out that role. And then lastly, the treasurer ensures that the financial viability of the organisation and, and ensures that proper processes and procedures exist for assuring all financial records, decisions and delegations are maintained. They oversee and present budgets, uh, accounts, financial statements and are responsible for audit processes and payments. 
Um, I've briefly set out here the differences between ineffective and effective boards. And just to highlight a couple, um, in an ineffective board, an organisation can start to drift away from its core mission or principles, which can cause a sense of confusion and disengagement for board members, employees, members and customers. And effective boards really make sure of the vision, priorities and objectives. Uh, I've heard, I'm sure that you've heard of that term, stale, male, pale and frail, um, which is a bit of an ungracious way of saying that effective boards have a diversity of voices and experiences, uh, are regularly refreshed and review themselves to ensure they are reflective of the community that they serve. In an ineffective board, sometimes the original founder of the organisation could be a long serving chief exec or chair, and they might have undue power or influence. Sometimes they may take on too much responsibility and spread themselves too thin. It's important to document the roles and responsibilities of key officers, including the limits on any delegated authority to make decisions like financial limits on payments or requirements for second signatures. And it's a good idea to write into the constitution the requirement for certain appointments to be refreshed every few years. Effective boards should ask themselves at least annually, are we fulfilling our governance obligations? Are we being effective? Are we giving our full support to the executive if there is one? Is full use being made of our skills? And you might want to do a, a skills audit of the board and how diverse are we? And you can do this through um, quite simply through questionnaires and interviews um, involving senior staff, but most importantly, uh, keeping the review on the board's agenda. Um, the board's role is the strategic directing project uh, or the organisation. It looks at the big picture. It's not about management, which is dealing with the day to day operating strategy. This table just sets out some of the key differences between the roles of board and management. And it's important that this distinction is recognised, understood and respected, particularly as in small organisations with no staff, trustees may have to wear other hats and deliver some of the management functions. If your organisation does have staff, the governing body will be able to delegate some or all of the day to day management and administration and your governing body's role remains strategic governance. So establishing overall strategy and priorities, safeguarding your organisation's assets and ensuring their effective use, monitoring and evaluating performance and supervising the senior employees. Another critical role of the board is to oversee the finances of the organisation to ensure that the organisation may remain solvent. Um, it should also develop and approve the business plan and regularly review and update this to ensure that it's realistic and sustainable. It, it has responsibility to approve the annual budget and oversee the reserves policy. If there are staff, it needs to have identified what levels of finance is delegated and it should also have financial controls and staff pay policies in place. Finally, and most importantly, it's every trustee's responsibility to understand the financial issues. You shouldn't rely on a finance committee or a treasurer to do this. And if you don't understand it, it's really important that you get it explained. So I've talked about governance structures and the principles of good governance and the role and makeup of the board. Um, so the kind of governance structure that you require is likely to change as you transition through various stages of the project. So I'm just going to run that um, run through some of those scenarios for you now. Um, it's really important that organisations periodically review their constitutions and models to ensure these are current and relevant to their charitable purpose and objectives. And reviewing those principles of good governance can really help sense check this. So in the early stages, before the project is even off the ground, you might have started off as an unincorporated campaign group trying to raise awareness for heritage building or structure and building community support. But this is unlikely to serve you for the duration of the project. If you're planning to take over responsibility for delivering a restoration project and managing the asset, you're likely to have made the decision to incorporate and gain charitable status. At this stage, you're likely to focus on identifying a feasible use for the heritage site and fundraising and incorporating and gaining charitable status can help you to gain grant funding and give confidence to your supporters and funding and funders. Um, 
I'm now going to kind of gloss over the huge amount of work that goes into getting a project off the ground. Uh, I'm going to jump straight into project delivery. Um, so at this point, imagine you may have bought or leased your building or acquired it through community asset transfer. Uh, you should have a clear vision and a robust business case in place. But transitioning from campaigning and early stage project development to project delivery can be challenging for a board. Um, whilst it's exciting that often long held ambitions are starting to take shape, the pace and workload is likely to increase and the types of skills required are also likely to change. Some trustees may find that their skills are no longer in demand and other critical skills may be required like project management. Whilst continuity is important, this may uh, also be a good time to review the skills of your board through a skills audit and try to recruit new trustees to fill any gaps. Moving further into delivery can sometimes see a board appoint staff or a greater pool of volunteers for the first time. Small organisations that previously had no staff will have often seen trustees play a management role. And it's really important as activity grows that the board steps back from these when the time comes and gets comfortable delegating responsibilities. And that principle four around decision making, risk and control is pretty critical here. Understanding when and how the roles and responsibilities change is an important part uh, of the role of the board and delegating responsibility to staff, specialists or contractors will likely change the feel of the board and there may be some board members that feel less involved. But it's really important to recognise at this point that the role of the board should be more about uh, oversight in those matters and that it will free up time for other activities. As a project progresses, the use of subcommittees can be a very effective way of managing responsibility. Subgroups can look at certain aspects of a project or area of work in an organisation. Authority can be delegated to them to be able to make decisions at a certain level and then report back to the board. And this can allow more detailed day to day work to happen and keep things moving. Subcommittees should have at least one trustee leading it, allowing communication between the subcommittee and the board in relation to progress, decision making, issues and risk. It removes the need for the board to manage every element of the project and board meetings can be used to review the progress and strategy of the project as a whole. Assembling subcommittees also means that you can bring in more people uh, with the required skills and experience without needing to expand the board beyond a manageable size. And some example subcommittees might be around trading and commercial, finance or marketing and communications. Once your building restoration project is complete, there's going to be another period of organisational change and transition where you could be moving to managing new tenants or running the operations yourselves. Now may be the time to consider establishing a trading subsidiary to generate income outside of the main objectives of your organisation and to help with the long term financial sustainability. Uh, another option through the stages of the project is closing the charity. So the decision to close a charity might be for a number of reasons. It may have finished what it set out to achieve. Another body might have taken over the project. Uh, perhaps there's not been enough members to continue and interest has waned. Um, you might have negotiated merger with another charity or simply you're changing your structure. Before you decide to close, consider what the governing documents say, particularly if the charity has any unallocated assets. Um, you'll need to cover all debts and liabilities before the balance can be transferred to another comparable charity. If you've run a fundraising appeal that's not been successful and you've got funds remaining, uh, you need to return these to donors where possible or clarify and declare what you've done with them if not. And if you can't meet your liabilities, including any redundancy, seek advice and contact the insolvency service uh, at gov.uk in the first instance. And each of the three charitable structures I've mentioned, so that's the Charitable Trust, the Charitable Company Limited by Carranty, and the CIO, have slightly different closing procedures, but I won't go into those now. But it is important to check with the regulator for the correct procedure for that. Uh, and then once the charity is closed, you'll need to store the accounting records for up to three years, but, and it's actually six for, for other um, non-charitable organisations. And you should also make sure that you inform and thank any of your supporters. So I'm um, nearly finished, just got a couple of minutes. Um, I just want to leave you with some top tips uh, and some further resources. So firstly, um, my first tip is to talk to people who've gone before you. 
there's a huge community of people in the heritage sector of people who have delivered heritage projects, um, talk to people whether online or in person about their experiences and lessons learned. There's also lots of umbrella organisations and networks that can help put you in touch or offer advice to other, um, yeah, or offer advice or other guidance. And I've got a list on my last slide. Um, when setting up a new organisation, it's really important to have that clear shared view of the vision and mission for your organisation. Think carefully about your strategy and articulate the vision continually to all your stakeholders. Spend some time thinking about what you want from your organisation um, and then choose the right uh, legal format. And having your vision and mission clear should help you with this, but take professional advice if you're not sure. Uh, take a look at the, the people on your board and do they all look and sound the same? Addressing equality, diversity and inclusion can really help a board make better decisions and stay relevant to those it serves. The board will be more effective because it reflects different perspectives, experiences and skills, including from current and future beneficiaries. Be professional. Um, sometimes, particularly organisations that started out as campaign groups um, can have a bit of a reputation for being a little bit troublesome. Um, you might have been, uh, you know, previously your role, your role might have been about um, challenging or highlighting an owner's poor maintenance of a building or a council's slow progress, but keep your criticisms and praise professional. You really want to demonstrate that you can properly manage conflict and conflicts of interest. And by presenting the leadership of your organisation and approaching a project in a professional manner, you'll be more likely to secure the confidence of funding sources, local authorities and stakeholders, and demonstrate that your ambitions are both well intentioned and well thought out. Uh, finally, keep reflecting. The kind of governance structure that you acquire is likely to change as you transition through various stages of project. And it's really important that um, organisations periodically review their constitutions and models to ensure that these are current and relevant to their charitable purposes and objectives. Um, so finally, I've just dropped in what I think are some of the key resources that you might want to consider um, and explore a bit further when you're thinking about governance. Um, so just very quickly, uh, some things to highlight. You've got the UK Heritage Trust Network, which was previously the UK Association of Preservation Trusts. Uh, and that's the umbrella organisation for not-for-profit organisations and, individual, and individuals working to regenerate heritage assets. Um, it provides support and guidance to its members, um, but as a not-for-profit group, you can join it for free at its connect level, um, which does give you access to its toolkit of resources. Um, and then the other one, just to highlight, as I noticed something this week, is the National Council for Voluntary Organisations. So um, the NCVO's know-how website, um, it's really useful providing advice and support for voluntary organisations and it's got loads of tools and resources for trustees. It is a membership organisation and usually its tools and resources are behind a member login. Um, but if you're quick, I notice that they're redoing their website, so they've made it free access until July, so you can have a good nosy um, if you get in before then. Um, and then finally, I, I've put locality there, my community website details there as well. They've got loads of tools and information um, that you'd need to get a, a project started. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Sorry, 